Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am extremely pleased and blessed, alhamdulillah, to be here with you today uh, to talk about this great topic, uh, which is the hijrah of Rasulullah sallam, the migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, this is one of these events. Uh, I personally, I think, I, I talked at least, again, three, four, five times before about the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, alhamdulillah, I attended numerous lectures, uh, read multiple books about this. Uh, the thing is, every single time I attend something new or I read something different, it's an event that never stops giving in terms of the lessons that can be learned from it. And there's always more insights and there's always more things to be said and there's always more things to be contemplated over when it comes to the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, by no means in this uh, time that we have with our, like for ourselves uh, around an hour or so, uh, will I be able to cover all of the different facets of this or all of the different aspects uh, that included in the, in the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But moreover, one of the things that I wanted to focus on which I'm, again, I'm pretty sure we're not gonna be able to cover it all as well, but we'll, we'll try to do our best to do the most that we can, are the lessons learned from this. So not only we're trying to, uh, uh, to do, like it's not kind of a story only, there is a story behind it that is extremely interesting and it's extremely uh, important for us, for our children, for all uh, Muslims and non-Muslims for that matter to learn about it. Uh, there's a lot of lessons for everyone to learn from it though, right? So my goal inshallah today is, to walk you through the events that preceded Hijrah on a very high level, focus more on the Hijrah itself as an event and what happened during the Hijrah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But at the end, or maybe during it as well, we'll see, but at the end, we wanna focus on what lessons we can learn from this. So again, the goal is for us to listen to this, understand that, and try to see how can we implement this in our lives. Uh, I see it again, we are again passing through trying times uh, with the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, but subhanAllah, even with the hijrah, sometimes again, I'm, again when, I'm talking, when I'm thinking about the lessons that we can learn from it, although it's not directly related sometimes to what we can do again with, from, from COVID perspective, from vir vir virus perspective, and pandemic perspective, but there's a lot of lessons that kind of generic enough or general enough that will be applicable in this particular uh, events that we're doing, but not just beyond dealing with the pandemic itself, but just different aspects of life that we can learn from. So that's a very quick and general introduction about what we're trying to achieve today, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give me the ability to say what's right and what is beneficial, but give you also the ability to comprehend this and act upon it, or both of us, inshallah. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start again with setting up the uh, background for al hijrah before we talk about hijrah itself, one of the interesting things that again, a lot of us might know already, we know when we talk about the way we talk about uh, what we call our cal calendar, our Islamic calendar, uh, we say the year so-and-so of the hijrah. And it's extremely interesting to understand that the Muslims, and specifically as far as again, my, my reading goes, is this happened, the event to choose when do we start the Islamic calendar, happened during the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu arda. That means before then, Arabs, okay, during that time, they, a lot of times they would uh, date events by major events, like date events or date their lives by major events. For instance, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us about uh, like the incident of Al-Fil, of the elephant attacking Mecca, right, and the, 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 the army that came to, to destroy Kaaba. And we know from, again, from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, was born during that time or like during that year, Am al-Fil, they call it. Uh, so this is how they say, okay, we are five years from Am al-Fil. Right? Or another major event that happens and they start saying we are so many years away from this. And that's how they used to date things. Until the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, they, he had like a discussion with the Sahaba about what can be an event or what can be a time for us to start dating our Islamic calendar. The reason is, again, they would, as Umar Khattab would exchange mail 
uh, letters with the different governors in the in the Islamic uh, uh, in the Islamic world at that point. Uh, they wanted to write something again. When did I read? When did this letter reach me? Is it like which year? Do you want to make sure basically there's a way for us to or for the Muslims to keep track of this time? And after discussions that included, by the way, the time of the birth of Prophet ﷺ being the time that they start counting from, or the time where Rasulullah ﷺ becomes a prophet with the first revelation, or other times, and or the time the Prophet ﷺ passed away, what they reached out towards the end is they're going to start dating from the time of the hijrah of Rasulullah Wasallam, And that by itself tells us how important this event in our Islamic history. So that's, again, another introduction to the how we came up about this Islamic calendar to start from the time of hijrah. And now if we go through the events, you can understand how important that is, inshallah, and how this is something that can be impacted in our lives. So let's set up the stage here. What's the background before hijrah? As we know, Rasulullah has been in Mecca before the time of Hijrah for 13 years. These 13 years, Rasulullah calling the people of Mecca to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become Muslims and believe in this, this religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to Muhammad. And Rasulullah, the message is very simple: La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God, there's no one worthy of worship except Allah one and alone. And I, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he's the one who's making the da'wah, is his prophet. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa has sent me to teach you this message, to talk to you about this message. The people of Quraysh are not, uh, sometimes we try to, uh, uh, to portray them again and again in different ways as not very smart people. Okay? Uh, you know, this, uh, they, they're worshipping these idols, and, which is true. But what you understand is, or what you should understand is that they had a sophisticated system. They did understand what La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah entailed and meant. It's not just words, but they understood that if we were to follow this message, there are going to be a lot of repercussions. There's going to be a lot of consequences based on this word. And that's what kept a lot of the folks or the, the, the leaders of Quraysh from accepting the message of the Prophet ﷺ for all of these 13 years. And during the first years, Rasulullah had the protection of his uncle. And he had the support from, from his tribe or from his family, generally speaking. But after his uncle, uh, uncle Abu Talib passed, now the time, again, for Quraysh, the, 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 the punishment or the, uh, the attacks on Rasulullah Sallallahu and his companions increased tremendously over that time. And what happened is Rasulullah Sallallahu starting with this, again, after the passing of his uncle, he starts looking for alternatives. Alternatives for places that he can go and make this da'wah flourish. Or he had a place where he's not going to have all of this opposition and of all of this punishment from the people, the, 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 the kuffar around him. And we know again, early in the seerah as well, Rasulullah has sent multiple contingencies, as I call it, to Habasha, Abyssinia at that time, for hijrah. So he wanted to send a smaller group of people where he can establish over there, and they become a kind of, I won't say a backup, but in case that Muslims were really attacked and it was really hard for them to survive in Mecca, at least there are some Muslims outside. So the concept of hijrah is not something that is brand new. But to take the whole da'wah, including the Prophet wasallam, and go somewhere else, that was the new thing. And that's what we're talking about here. So we said Rasulullah stayed all of this time in Mecca, facing all of this opposition the punishment from the Quraysh, all of the, 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 the bad things that happened to his companions, some of, them, some of them martyred. And then finally, at some point, during these different discussions with people, different tribes that used to come to Mecca for the time of Hajj, he was able to find the group, subhanAllah, that was going to be supporting him. And this is the group of Yathrib, of al Medina, as we know it now, okay? and Aus al Khazraj, that used to live in this. A couple of years before, started, some of them became, they came to Mecca, and these, again, year after year, they became Muslim. And Rasulullah sent someone with the Musa ibn Amir to become his ambassador and teach about Islam. And at that point, before, right before the Hijrah, they have committed to Rasulullah وسلم, that they were providing him this protection for him and of all of his companions and all Muslims as well. And they understood that 
by accepting Rasulullah for him to come to Medina, they are basically, I would say declaring a war, but they should be expecting a declaration of war from the people of Quraysh at least, if not others as well. Because now for the first time, again, they have a place where Rasulullah can be there. He's going to be the leader of this group, but the Quraysh would not let that go easily because they understand there's a lot of, like I said, uh, implications, there are a lot of consequences, especially under trade and things along these lines, if Rasulullah and his companions become a strong contingency. While they are in Mecca, they can con still control them to a certain extent. But once they leave Mecca, now it becomes much, much harder. And that's why if the people of Aus and Khajaj of Yathrib, of Medina, accept Rasulullah and his companions, that's said, it's a way of Quraysh declaring war on them because they're not going to accept this new power of Rasulullah so that's kind of the background that we have before the Hijrah. What happens as well, Rasulullah now that he, as a matter of fact, initially he got the, the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the companions to start moving, Rasulullah was one of the last to leave for the Hijrah. So he ordered his companions one after the other, group after the other, to start leaving and fleeing towards Medina. And then Quraysh would wake up one day in the morning and they find a bunch of people missing from the companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or a whole, a whole group was missing. And that's how it went. Step by step, a lot of people would start leaving towards Medina, and Quraysh, of course, again, they are observing this. For the most part, or for a lot of the people that left uh, to Medina, a lot of it happened uh, kind of in secret. The exception that we know, and again, the glaring exception that is always mentioned in the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is that of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu abba. Well, Umar ibn Khattab, as a matter of fact, before he left, he just went to Kaaba and he said, hey, by the way, again, and this is something that, I guess, alhamdulillah, from our collective imagination and memory of Umar ibn Khattab, a lot of us can accept that. A lot of times, this is how we understand Umar to be radiallahu anhu abba. Umar ibn Khattab, what exactly he, he does, he goes to Kaaba and he calls out the people of Mecca. He says, oh, people of Mecca, I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm going to Medina. If anyone wants to lose, basically, for their wives to become a widow or for their children to become, uh, to become orphaned, again, let them meet me outside Mecca where I'm going. So it was the kind of very obvious, very, very straightforward message to the people of Mecca, I am leaving. And not only did he do that on the Allahu Anhu Arda, but he also, subhanAllah, he also supported all of the weak Muslims that could not do that. So a lot of the, the companions who were, didn't have the backup of families or the strength that they have, they found in Umar al Khattab this refuge. Say, we'll follow Umar, we'll just do our hijrah with Umar because nobody's going to come out to oppose Umar radiallahu anhu. So that's an example where Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu, with this group of weak Muslims, again, they, have, like, they don't have the support, as we said, they traveled with him to Medina. There are some few people that were left back before this hijrah. Amongst them, again, there were again there were some still weak Muslims. Again, when I mean weak, that means that they don't have the support, they don't have the power to leave on their own. A lot of times, their families hold, with their own families would hold them hostage in Mecca, or they imprisoned them in Mecca for fear of them leaving. So these are the mustadafin, as they call them, like the the ones that were that didn't have the, the power to leave on their own, basically, uh, and uh, and they were left behind. But among the people who can leave on their own, and Rasulullah chose not to, to ask them or give them the permission to leave, were a couple of main Sahaba. Amongst them was Ali ibn Abi Talib, and we'll talk about his, 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 uh, uh, his part of the plan or his, his mission as a part of the Hijrah, and Abu Bakr as Siddiq. As a matter of fact, Abu Bakr as Siddiq came to Rasulullah before this when he, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Allow me to do hijrah. I'm ready to go. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he looks at me and said, Abu Bakr, just hold on, be patient. You never know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you a companion, for you a companion in this journey. Abu Bakr Siddiq is, is, is a smart guy, of course, an extremely smart guy. And he understood that this is a kind of a, an indication from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he is asking him to stay and that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be his companion in this mission or this journey of Hijrah to Medina. So Abu Bakr Siddiq was stayed put. 
Ali ibn Abi Talib as well was, was ordered by Rasulullah to stay put, not to leave from Mecca to Medina yet for this sigil. As time goes, he said, the Quraysh are looking at this, they understand what's happening, they understand that these people are going to, to Medina, the rumors are coming back again, where, where are all these Sahaba and Sahabiyat are going and they're going to Medina. So they understand what's happening here. And they call on for an urgent meeting. Okay. Something said, this is, this is something that is of extreme importance. There's something that's, kind of, uh, that's happening here in the community and we have to stop it before it becomes even a bigger problem for them. And they have this huge conference in what the place they call Dar al-Nadwa. Dar al-Nadwa, as you can think about it, I sometimes refer to it as the Congress of Mecca. This is where all of the different leaders would sit down and, and deliberate and, and, and discuss things of, of importance. And we come up with major decisions. And you can think about this as kind of a thriving community, like a thriving community, I'm sorry, where a lot of different families, a lot of different, again, parts of the tribe, but they have leaders representing them in Dar al-Nadwa, in this Congress of Mecca, where they discuss all of these major events and major decisions that they want to take as a whole, as a people of Mecca, of Quraysh as a whole. So they call for this urgent meeting in Dar al-Nadwa. And now they start discussing, he said, okay, we understand what's happening, we see what's happening in front of our own eyes. Day after day, there are fewer Muslims staying amongst us, or followers of Muhammad وسلم, staying amongst us, and they're all leaving towards Medina. And you all understand, again, what that means. They understand, as you said, initially you said, their trade that routes pass through this. But not only that, you have to understand that Quraysh, at that point, was looked as kind of the leaders of the Arab tribes as a whole. So they have this political power. They are the political powerhouse, if you may. And now they have, as well, the Kaaba, where all of the people come from all over the Jazeera Arabia, from the, the Arabian Peninsula, for their Hajj. Okay. So they have the religious power, they have the political power, and they were definitely a stronghold in terms of the economical power as well. Okay. People coming to Mecca to do trade, that was the norm as well. All of these different parts of their power structure are being uh, threatened by just the mere fact that Rasulullah now moving his da'wah from Mecca to Medina, and now he's going to have the support, whether again the power support, like the meaning, like the not of the military, but uh, the people passing like this, the companions of Yathrib, giving him this, this, uh, this physical support to fight against any of the mushrikeen if, if they are attacked. But also now, they will be going to be on the trade routes. So now they have some kind of economical power as well. We can stop trade or interfere with the trade that's happening to Mecca. And now Rasulullah of course, also is calling in for, for, in their opinion, a different religion, a new religion. So he's also threatening their religious power. So all of this is something that they are discussing in Dar al-Nadwa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually describes this to us in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Basically he says, and, and this can be translated, it says, and, and recall, O Muhammad, when the disbelievers were conspiring against you to hold you as a captive, or to kill you, or to expel you. And let me just give you again a one minute uh, kind of view of this. What happens a part of the discussions is they start coming up with different ideas. But one of these ideas is said, okay, now his companions left him, or a lot of them left him. We still have a chance to just hold him captive here. So imprison him, put him in prison until he dies. And now again, he's completely separated from his people, from his companions. There's no one to protect him. Just let's do that. So that was one of the different. Uh, one of the one of the options they provide and sooner or later again after the discussion they kind of threw it out and it's not going to work out another opinion that came was said okay if we're not gonna imprison him let's let's exile him throw him somewhere outside mecca and outside medina of course but somewhere where they cannot reach him as well so when you exile him again he's gonna be completely still again disconnected from people he's gonna go somewhere it's completely uh, again, foreign for him, and he's not going to be able to do anything, just let's put him away at that. And again, that was one of these things that shut down pretty quickly as well. Last but not least was the opinion as the seerah, the, the books of seerah tell us, they say this is the opinion of Abu Jahl. Okay. Abu Jahl came and said, no, okay, that's not going to work out. Here's the opinion, here's what we need to do. Okay. And just again, for kind of a side note, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know him as Abu Jahl, 
his name Abu Hakam. His name is completely different, right? He's a guy of wisdom, right? The, the pretty. But Abu Jahl, Rasulullah talked about him. He said, "Hala fi hadhi al-umma." This is the pharaoh of this umma of Muslimin, like the the, the, the time of, of of Islam. There's going to be someone who's extremely uh, arrogant, extremely again uh, forceful against the da'wah of Allah of the of the call to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And Abu Jahl was one of these people. He knew that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the truthful one. He understood that he is a prophet. It was no doubt in his mind. But he said, "This is not going to happen." <laughs> We've been in consistent and con- yeah, his his family was part of the family. He's part of the tribe against the family of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They've always been com- in competition, and we were kind of as he, as he puts it. He says we were almost like two horses in a head-to-head or a neck-to-neck race. We, we, we beat them sometimes, they beat us sometimes, we're almost neck to neck, always next to each other. And now all of a sudden, one of Bani Hashim, of the, tribe of, uh, the, 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 the family of the tribe of Prophet ﷺ, comes, he says, I'm a prophet, which is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's like, how can we compete with this? We cannot compete with this. So he understood, he is a prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but Abu Jahan said, we're not gonna follow him, because now it's a matter of pride. It's my family versus your family. And we cannot accept that he's a prophet because that means our family is less in his mind than the family of Bani Hashim. Okay, so Abu Ahli comes with the opinion. He says, I have the, the opinion of that we go ahead and kill him. But this time we do it differently. The way we kill him is we take from each and every single family within Quraysh a strong young man, give him a sword, and ask them, all of them, to go and attack Muhammad وسلم, and kill him. And at that point, what's gonna happen is Banu Hashim, his tribe, his family, cannot fight against all of the rest of Quraysh. Because now it's just one person that they can go and, and take revenge from, but now the, the death of Prophet is committed by the entire society, or the entire community of Quraysh. And that's the way you can force Banu Hashim to accept just blood money instead of them fighting against you. And that was the opinion that they all agreed upon. So the plan was in, in motion, collecting these or gathering these young folks, providing them with the weapons, and they were supposed to attack Rasulullah that night. They would go and sit in front of his house, wait for him to go outside, and then attack him and kill him, all of them together. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is always the norm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the protector of the believers of all of the believers. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of this plan. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takes action directly and automatically that night or that day when he is informed. And what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does, and that tells you again, when you see now they're gonna go over the, the, the events of al hijrah you do understand that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that was not like, a spur of the moment, oh, I, what am I going to do? And let me, let me take an action right now. No, that was well deliberately planned ahead of time. It was just waiting for the right time to execute the plan of Hijrah. But that was all thought through and was planned ahead of time. And that's another lesson we're going to learn from the Hijrah of Rasulullah That day when Rasulullah was informed, and again, supposedly that night, they're going to, they're going to start, the Quraysh is going to put the plan in place to kill him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to the house of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq Aisha radiallahu anha in the hadith, she explains this event. She said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would actually almost come to us daily. And that again shows you the, the level of relationship Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had with Abu Bakr. He would almost be in their house daily. Companionship, friendship. Sometimes we think of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we put him in a very high status. Of course, he is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we follow him as an example. But sometimes we lose this human aspect that he had friends. He would go and hang out with Abu Bakr Siddiq as a friend. Let alone, again, he is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and worked as a companion. But keep that in mind as well. The social aspect of it was still there. So Aisha radiallahu anhu says, says, every day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would come to us. Usually during the day or sometimes like in the evening or like we're doing Maghrib time. And that day, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was coming to us at a time he usually would not, would, not, would not come. And this is usually the time of Dhuhr. The time of Dhuhr in Mecca is extremely hot. 
a lot of people would take this time to nap, as a matter of fact. And they would not be doing business or anything like that. So it would be indoors to make sure that they, they don't get, again, the heat of the sun or they get don't get impacted by it. But, but Rasulullah was going towards the house of Abu Bakr al-Sadiq. And they say he had something covered, head covered, basically covered, kind of hiding his face, hiding his, his head while he was walking. And usually there's not many people over there. But they spotted him, again, the family of Abu Bakr said, hey, Rasulullah is coming. And Abu Bakr immediately understood and said, he's not coming. We can, if he comes at that time of the day, which he does not usually come, that's a grave matter. That's an important thing. So Rasulullah comes in, Abu Bakr Siddiq again, welcomes him in. And Rasulullah in that time it was Rasulullah, Abu Bakr, and there was family members of Abu Bakr's household only, like Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, Aisha uh, bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, they were sitting there. So uh, Rasulullah looks at Abu Bakr and he says, basically, we need to have a conversation uh, in privacy, so let your, your family away, basically. Let, let, we need to have this very important talk. And Abu Bakr Siddiq looks at Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah, and I, this is my family, I, kind of, I trust them, like, it's fine. And Rasulullah has this conversation. He said, Ya Abu Bakr, it's time now. It's time for us to do the hijrah. And Abu Bakr Siddiq, he hears this and he starts crying. Uh, tears just fallen from his eyes, radiallahu anhu. And I want to put this in perspective. They're not going on a, on, a, on a family trip. They're not going on a nice journey for, again, let's just go out and have fun. They're going on a trip that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu understands that this is going to be one of the toughest trips, one of the most, again, dangerous trips that they've had in their lives. But he starts crying out of happiness. As Aisha radiallahu anhu and I explained, she said, I've never understood or knew that people can cry because of happiness. Until I saw Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu crying when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa informed him that he would be his companion on this trip to Medina. He starts crying out of happiness that his follower who is going to be the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And Abu Bakr Siddiq immediately, what does he say? He says, Ya Rasulullah. And that tells you, again, he's an intelligent person. And this is not people who are sitting there just looking for. They have been planning ahead for this. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I have two camels that I've been raising for this trip. I knew this day would come. And it's not just one camel. He said two camels. Because he knew that Prophet Sallallahu again, from the time that he told him, may, may you, Allah may, may have a companion for you. He understood that he's going to be traveling with Prophet Sallallahu So he had two camels prepared specifically for this trip been raising them, feeding and it just for this particular trip. And I'm ready to go whenever you have. Rasulullah responds to him, he says, what? He says, okay, Abu Bakr. Jazakallah, this is great. He says, but I'll take the camel, I have to pay for it. Okay. And then again, that's another lesson here. Rasulullah, this is his companion, this is his friend. But people who are doing da'wah, people like, like Rasulullah, he is the Imam of Dua, right? He is the, the leader of all of Dua that comes afterwards, afterwards that people are making da'wah. He is the leader. And he is teaching us a lesson. He says, even if that's the case, a person of da'wah is not a person who is going to be looking for people, others, kind of just to support him. He's like always looking for others to help him and support. And they have to have this independence. And that's exactly what Rasulullah is doing. Saying, yes, I'll take your camel. That's great. Jazakallah. But... I'll have to pay for it. So that's another lesson. And then they start doing the planning of this. They understood that they're going to be leaving that night. Okay? And Rasulullah gives him the plan. I'll go over the plan in a second here. But what happens is, Abu Bakr Siddiq now is ready. The camels are ready. Okay? They start packing them as a matter of not packing, but you know, putting the stuff that they need for the trip on, on the camels, of course. The, the family of Abu Bakr helps them out. But what is the plan? Okay? The plan was to leave that night. Yes, and we understood, remember we said that the Quraysh are going to put their plan as well to kill the Prophet the same exact night. So what Rasulullah does, he says, okay, here's the plan. We have multiple people who are going to be part of this plan. Now I want to give you the names of them. He says, first of all, you have Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr, he is the son of Abu Bakr Siddiq. So I want to give you the names and I'm going to talk about their, each one's part of this plan. Abu, Abdullah ibn Abu Bakr, okay? He's the son of Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu. 
and his, he's going to be in charge of collecting intelligence from Mecca. Yeah. Actually, before we know, I'll go there. I'll take a step back and say what the plan is. I want to get a different perspective. I'm sorry. I'll take a step back. Excuse me for this. So what's going to happen, he said, that night, Rasulullah said, now he's going to go back. He's in the time of book. He's going to go back home and prepare himself. And that night, he's supposed to come back with Abu Bakr Siddiq. They leave towards a place called Ghar Thawr. From a geographical perspective, Al Medina is north of Mecca. This Ghar Thawr is outside Mecca towards the south. If I'm not saying southeast of Mecca. So, completely different direction. He is, they're supposed to be going north, and that's what everyone would expect. He's going to Medina, he's going to be going north. But rather, Rasulullah goes south, the opposite direction, okay, to where Medina is. And they would stay in this Ghar Thawr for three days. In these three days, they'll just stay put, make sure that, again, nobody is following them or anything like that. And they just go, okay, they're going to go to this Ghar, by the way, walking at that point. But part of the plan for, the plan for these three days is, let's talk about the people I just started. They have Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr. He is the son of Abu Bakr Siddiq. He would be staying in Mecca. And he would be the uh, intelligence gatherer. He was going to be the intelligent, intelligence agent. He's going to be sitting there in Mecca, listening to what Quraysh are planning for, understanding what's happening there. And he would come usually at night to Rasulullah and Abu Bakr Siddiq in Ghartal to inform them of what is going on in Mecca and what the plans are and so forth. So that's one. Two, is Asma bint Abi Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha, the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha. She is the one who is in charge of bringing food and drink to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr and Gharta as well. Okay. So that's her mission. Yeah. Going every day. By the way, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu has blessed me with a visit to, again, Mecca multiple times. I did the trip from Mecca to Gharta with a car. And it took us a little while. And then I went all the way down to the bottom of this it's on it like the, the ghar, the like the kind of cave, I would say the cavern or this place is is on top of a hill. It's a steep mountain, like not a hill, it's a steep mountain. It's not an easy ride. It's not like oh let me just go up it. It's a steep, tough terrain to go up there. And Asma bin Abi Bakr anha, in some of the narrations says she was actually pregnant at that time. While she is pregnant, she would take this food and drink. To Rasulullah and Abu Bakr as a part of this plan while they're staying in this ghar for three days. The third person is Amr ibn Abi Fuhayra. Amr ibn Abi Fuhayra is one of the servants of Abu Bakr Siddiq. He is actually a shepherd. And Abu Bakr Siddiq would give him his sheep basically to go and graze him and all this kind of stuff, feed him during that day. But the idea there was what? Is now we have Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr, Asma ibn Abi Bakr walking towards this place every day to give food and drink and intelligence and so forth. And what Amr would do, he would come with his sheep and walk in these paths to cover the footsteps. You see how detailed this, this plan is. They have someone to make sure that they cover these footsteps so now no one would be able to follow them in the desert again and make sure where Rasulullah is. So this is the Amr ibn Abi Fuhayra. And of course, as well, when he was there, he has the sheep, he'll give them milk and other stuff as well. Last but not least was Abdullah ibn Urayqit. Abdullah ibn Urayqit was their guide in the desert. Abdullah ibn Abu Urayqit, interestingly, he was a non-Muslim. And he was the, among the people of living in, in Mecca. Rasulullah trusted him enough to tell him the whole plan. And trusted him enough, again, when they got the camels, they give it to Abdullah ibn Uraiqa. said, you keep the camels and you meet us after three days in this particular location, which is Gharfa. And Abdullah ibn Abu Uraiqa, we said he, he is a, 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 an expert, let's put it, an expert guide in the routes or the travel to Medina. So he is the person who's going to take them through a completely different route than the usual route that people from Mecca to would take, like kind of the main highway, if you may, right? You might know some of these side uh, parallel, uh, like not highways, but like side roads. That's exactly what Abdullah ibn Uraiqat is supposed to be doing. Taking them, not through the main road, but a completely alternative route that not many people either know or try to go towards Medina. 
And as a matter of fact, it's a more like tougher road, let's put it that way, okay, to take. But this is part again of the plan. So you see Rasulullah this did not come in like a single spare of the moment. That's consistent planning that took some time to think about. And he said, we just put the plan in motion when the command came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Rasulullah now it's time to do the hijrah because of the plan of Mecca. An interesting thing as well to see, everyone I told you, I said, Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, both son and daughter, or daughter and son of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha. Abu Bakr is the companion of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this tough trip as well. Amr ibn Fuayra is a servant of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha. The only exception is Abdullah ibn Urayqit who is not part directly related to Abu Bakr Siddiq. But the whole family, the whole household is in the service or servitude of this da'wah, of Rasulullah sallallahu of Islam, that's exactly what this household of Abu Bakr is doing. Not only is he putting himself in harm's way by being the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on this trip, but the whole household is part of it. Again, a lesson for all of us. Now we're saying that I can be a person who is engaged in serving the community. But how about my, my family? How about my wife and kids? Am I getting them involved as well? Am I passing on the baton to them to say, hey, it's not just your father or your mother or your brother or your sister doing it. We as a collective, we need to all some way or the other contribute towards this path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We might not all have the same skill set. Every one of us is different. And every one of us can do something different. But we engage ourselves each in their own parts of expertise or the parts where they are they can they can contribute contribute to the community contribute to this da'wah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their own way but that's a lesson from the household of Abu Siddiq radiallahu anhu every one of them is engaged one way or the other whether it's directly or indirectly in this da'wah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala islam the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the success of this da'wah is just part of their dna it's not a second thought. It's not an afterthought. And that's exactly what we see in this, in this uh, plan of, uh, of uh, Al-Hijrah. You do understand as well that this is it. It's not any of them being caught participating towards this particular effort. They are putting themselves in great harm's way. So what happened again? Let's talk about now during the time. So now that we have the plan in place, we understand how much work is being done there. Let's talk a little bit more about the, um, uh, let's talk about, again, what happened during the actual hijrah itself. So now Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let's go back, take a step back during the day of Sallam. Remember, he left the house of Abu Bakr Siddiq, went back to his house to start preparing for the hijrah himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And now the, the role of Ali ibn Abi Talbah is, is apparent. Part of his role, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him to stay behind, not to go to, Mac to Medina yet as a part of the hijrah. And he would play this dual role at that point. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he wanted someone to stay in his house during that night, sleep in his bed during that night. So to give Quraysh the impression that someone is there, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is there, right? So that's the, this is, the, this is the, the part of the mission that would fall on Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu arba. Again, not an easy mission. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa of course, gives him the glad time. And he said, just to let you know, be aware, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised me that no harm is going to befall you when you're sitting in this place but the second thing which is extremely important as well and tells you the akhlaq of a muslim what the manners of a muslim should be and where do we get these manners where do we get this example definitely rasulullah sallallahu rasulullah sallallahu keeps his cousin ali ibn abi Talib behind because the kuffar of Quraysh, even though they are completely against rasulullah sallallahu they're fighting against him they are giving him all shapes and forms of punishment and, and again, and oppression. And they have this, they understood that he was the trustworthy one, a person of character, of moral character. So if anyone would have something of value in Quraysh, they want to put it somewhere safe, they'd actually take it to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, imagine that time they didn't have banks or safes or safe. They would take their amanat, these things that are they want to keep safe, give it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for him to keep it safe for them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows that he's going to be leaving. 
he wants a way for him to give back all of these amanat to the kuffar of Quraysh that have been fighting him, killing his companions, giving him a hardship and hard time yet. This is the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu Thus, that should be our akhlaq of Muslim. Ali ibn Abi Talib would be the person who would do that. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi leaves, he would be the person who will go out and hand out all of these people, the, the amanat, okay? The things that they left safe for Rasulullah sallallahu to give it back to their own owners or the people who want it. So that's the plan of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, or this is the part of the mission of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu in this hijrah. Last but not least, that night, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a miracle happened. And then we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes this whole planning that we talked about is essential, is important. As a matter of fact, it's a must. We need to exert our own human effort to the utmost. But when we exert this human effort to the utmost, we cannot forget that the tawfiq, success, support, help comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you and I can do our best in our own human capacity. But our own human capacity does not mean that we don't all succeed. If we rely on our own human capacity only, again, that's going to be always a failure. That's going to always be a failure, trust me. Again, whether it looks like a success, it still is a failure. Because we have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all our man- uh, matters. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them that the kuffar were going to be there. They're going to be attacking you or going to be attacking you that night. They have people sitting there, all of these youth sitting there outside to attack Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leaves from his house in the middle of the night while they're outside. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through a miracle, he blinds their eyes from seeing him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In some of the narrations, they say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out, took, grabbed a handful of dust basically, and walked, I'm going to be guilty my hands, but he walked over their heads putting this dust on their heads. While they are opening their eyes, their eyes are like that. They can't see him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his ways to support not only his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but to support all of the believers as well. And that's it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes from there, leaves in front of all of them, puts this dirt on top of their heads to let them know, by the way, you guys are dealing or you're going against Allah and his Prophet. Wake up. You cannot defeat Allah and His Prophet. You cannot go against it. If Allah is on your side, there's nothing you guys can do to push that or to defeat that. And that's exactly the message of putting this dirt on, on their head. Rasulullah Sallam goes and takes a book and he said, the, the plan is in, mo- in his emotion. They go and stay in Gharthal. And they were going to stay there for three days. And I talked about the other things that can happen during that day from Abdullah ibn Abu Bakr, Asma ibn Abu Bakr, Amr ibn Fuhayran. They're giving them the intelligence and food and so forth. But after all of this planning, okay, there's a lot of, again, interesting events. I'll just have to skip forward, skip on it because I can see the time again is, is passing now. But they go and stay in this Ghar, in this Ghar Thawr, the cave of, of, of Thawr. I don't know if Ghar is the right to the cave. I'm sorry, again, excuse my, my, my English. But, uh, but Ghar is kind of a small, it's not like a cavern, like Laurie caverns or something. It's not like a deep thing. It's a small kind of room or a small hole inside of a, of, of a, uh, of a mountain. Okay. So it's not like this huge thing that you go inside there. I want to keep this in mind as well as you understand it and, and, and imagine what the event is. So just a small kind of small room within like this, uh, this mountain. And so you go and stay in this ghar for these three days during that time. Of course, they woke up again. As a matter of fact, these, these people were waiting for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to attack him during that time. By the time of like when, when the like lights start coming out, or like the fedges start coming out, another older, gent- older, older man passes by and says, what are you guys doing here? He said, we're, we're waiting for Muhammad to come out. I said, what are you waiting for Muhammad? Muhammad left. I saw him leaving like that much time ago. I can't remember. I said, what? We're waiting on him. And as a matter of fact, during that time they were waiting, they would look through the door hole or whatever it is, try to look and see if he's still in there and they would see someone sleeping in his bed. So there's, again, they're imagining they are under the impression that this is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam still there. So when that happens, okay, all of a sudden he said, what are you talking about this to this man? I said, what are you talking about? We've been waiting all night. There's no way he left. So they break into the house of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now all of a sudden the surprise is there. What is Ali and Abi Talib sitting, sleeping in his bed? Of course, now they are like 
boiling or whatever it is, a fuming because of this. Again, they missed their opportunity to attack Rasulullah And they go and, and circle back, they go and tell the leaders of Quraysh. And Abu Jah, hearing this as well, he's like, no, this guy is, is beyond himself. It's like he's completely, again, angry. He knows directly. He said, you know what? We know who's still behind. Abu Bakr is still behind. They, they, they run to the house of Abu Bakr Siddiq, knock on the door, okay? And then Asma' bin Abu Bakr opens the door and says, where is your father? I don't know. Abu Jahl, he slaps her. Again, he hits her really hard on her face. He said to the extent that her, again, she starts bleeding from her, from her ear. And this is something, by the way, this is not something that is looked up upon during even the Jahili Arabs. That's something that is extremely, um, I don't know how to put it, that's extremely bad behavior. That's something that, that, that is, it, it's a way of them saying that this is a bad person if someone raises their hand or and attacks uh, a, a, a woman, that's something that's really looked down upon. But out of his anger, that's what he's done, right? And that did not, did not lead Asma to give out the secret of Rasulullah or his companion, Abu Bakr Siddiq She hold Heart. She stays hard. And she's like, I'm not going to give in. No, like, I don't know. Quraysh, now they are in the middle of it. Now they have to have a plan B. And the plan B was as follows. Said, they give out 100 camels as a prize for whoever, or as again a compensation for whoever finds Abu Bakr or Rasulullah dead or alive. Doesn't matter. Okay. And just to put this in perspective, a lot of people are saying, okay, 100 camels, what does that mean? Again, I, sometimes I refer to it as like, Imagine you have 100 Porsches or 100, 100 Lamborghinis or whatever it is. We're talking about like big money here. We're not talking about, say, oh, okay, life's talking. No, no, no. That's big money. Till the day, by the way, camels are extremely expensive. If you go somewhere like, like well-raised camels or somewhere in, in Saudi Arabia or like Emirates or somewhere, this is tons and tons of money. So that was a huge and reward, a compensation for those who are finding, who would find the Sulaiman Hassan or Abu Bakr Siddiqui. So that was the plan B. But they didn't stay put as well. They start looking themselves. So now the word is spread across the peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula. Find Muhammad dead or alive, we'll, we'll, and we want to take care of him again. Kill him or bring him back to us. And you get this reward. But then themselves, they started looking, start fetching, trying to find what Rasulullah sent them is. And what they do again, and this is something that is known amongst the Arabs, and amongst not just the Arabs, by the way, but this is a very known aspect. This is a, like a al al khutwat or like the al athar, taqassi al athar meaning that they're following footprints or following any kind of like trail, whether it's a camel, a horse, or footprints, or whatever it is, that's something that they do really well. And a lot of these, again, cultures back then around the world, they would have people who are specialized in that. They would be looking for tra tracks or trails and being able to follow it to the location of a particular person or something along these lines. And we said, you remember, that was a perfect plan, kind of a perfect plan from Rasulullah sent them having someone like Amir ibn Fuhayra, the shepherd, to come and cover the trails, the footsteps of Rasulullah Asma and, and, and Abdullah ibn Abu Bakr. But with all of this planning, yet Quraysh were able to make it all the way to Gharthaur, right there and then. They are in front of this cave of Gharthaur. Rasulullah and Abu Bakr are inside, and all they need to just Go inside. As a matter of fact, you don't even need to go inside. Just look down and see them, right? The heart is kind of like a little deep down there, right? So you have to look just down a little bit to see where they're hiding. There are different narrations about this as well. One of the narrations, and I think this is a famous known narration, again, we usually teach our kids and we, we, we teach it in like elementary school and things like that, where there is, they say that there was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on the door of this cave or the opening of this cave, okay, spider web. There was a spider web that was covering it. And some other narrations are saying, as a matter of fact, as well, there were kind of two uh, birds, uh, doves, sitting there as well, right, right, right in front of the, uh, in front of the, of the, like the door or the entrance of the cave, right? So this is one of the narrations. And I guess, it's, again, it's a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is under his command, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is not something that we say. This is a narration of it as well. The other narration says, no, there was nothing. It was just right open there and then. And that both of these cases, whether there was or there was not, depending on the narration, okay, doesn't matter. Why? Because at the end of the day, they were there. And this is a message for all of us. Some of the lessons we said we can learn from this is, 
you can do your utmost effort. You can do your best plan. But you still have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because after all of this tremendous planning, Quraysh were still able to reach all the way to the entrance or to the place of Rasul Sallallahu was hiding with Abu Bakr Siddiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a matter of fact, there's a hadith and there's, uh, 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 there's uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures this moment in the Quran as well in one of the verses. First of all, Abu Bakr Siddiq in this conversation, Abu Bakr Siddiq looks at Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after they left, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, لو أن أحدهم نظر إلى قدميه أبصرنا تحت قدميه. These people they were right there. They said, Ya Rasulullah, if these people were to just look underneath themselves at their feet, they would be able to look at us. They would be able to see us. Okay. Abu Bakr was was kind of nervous. And again, imagine you are put in this situation. These people are here to kill you. There's nothing again. There's no like joking around here. And that, he's not even focused on himself. But the law on Allah. He is focused on Rasulullah He's fearful for the life of Rasulullah So he was completely concerned. But Rasulullah was the complete opposite, subhanAllah. And Rasulullah looks at Abu Bakr and he tells him that, yeah, he said, yeah, Abu Bakr, what do you think about two people if Allah is their third, meaning that Allah is providing, providing the protection. Allah is with them to provide them this protection. If you are under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do you fear? And Rasulullah has this complete full iman and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he knew, not that just from the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he knew that he's done his utmost. And now at that point, this is tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I've done my part, now I'm completely reliant, knowing, feeling this, this, this sense of security that alhamdulillah I've done my part, I've done what I can do, but now I rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, it says, إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ Says, and he is reminding them, he says, oh, companions and others, he says, if you do not aid him, or oh, meaning the Prophet وسلم, remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided him this aid and support during the time of Hijrah. <laughs> he says, Allah subhanahu wa captures this, he says, remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him out for Hijrah and he protected him when there are two of them in the, in, in the ghar, in this cave, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one, again, and one of the companions was Abu Bakr Siddiq, looks at the Prophet and says, says sorry, Allah, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looks at Abu Bakr and says, don't be worried, don't fear, don't have any, any sadness, for as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is with us and is protecting us. And this is sort of tawbah. Okay. This is exactly what happens. And then Quraysh, they take back their, they just turn around and go back to Mecca and they're looking in other routes. Okay. That's how Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala protected them afterwards. Again, I'm kind of, again, I'm, I'm looking at my time, and I know I don't have like five minutes to go. So let me just go quickly over a couple of other things before then we can conclude here. What happens afterwards after these three days staying in Ghar, as planned, Rasulullah وسلم, and Abu Bakr Siddiq meet with their guide, who is Abdullah ibn Abi Uraiqit, Abdullah ibn Uraiqit, and Abdullah ibn Uraiqit start taking them, and I said, a completely different path that's closer to the uh, to the sea uh, line again, the Red Sea at that point, they're moving closer to the coast, the sea coast. I'm sorry, and they were going towards this this place. Even during that time as well, there's multiple miracles again during that time that happens. But one of them, I'll, I'll conclude with this: is now they are Quraysh behind them, still looking for them. They don't know where they at. It's been three days that you're looking for them, but the word has been out during the like in this time in the Arabian Peninsula that Muhammad and his companion Abu Bakr Siddiq. They are out there and we need to start looking for them because we can get these hundred camels. And as they were going through this path, one of these other events happened. As a matter of fact, there was uh, Suraq ibn Malik. There was a, 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 a person who became a companion afterwards, Suraq ibn Malik. Suraq ibn Malik was living on the path, basically, on, on this way, close, far, far away from Mecca, uh, on the way to Medina. And a person comes and he says, hey, by the way, I did see on the coast a couple of people walking out there, right? And Suraqa is the leader of his, basically of his tribe. And he knew automatically. This person, as a matter of fact, he says, I, it might be Muhammad and his companion that they're looking for, by the way. So Suraqa looks at him and says, no, 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 forget about them. I know that these are other people that I sent them out to go and walk there. But Suraqa in his mind, he wants the hundred camels. He understands that this is, that might be it, basically. So he tells his people, and everyone sitting in this gathering, he says, forget about it, no, no, no. I know who these people are, it's not Muhammad. So basically don't look for them. 
But he goes back to his house like directly afterwards and he takes his horse and he's trying going towards this direction to find Muhammad وسلم, and his companion Abu Bakr Siddiq. And they were having, at that point they had Amr ibn Fuhayra was with them. And of course, Adlan Raqqad the guide was with them as well on this mission. And as Suraqa comes close, he said, I, as I'm coming, he's, he's the one narrating Hadith, he comes, he becomes a Muslim afterwards. He said, as Suraqa becomes close, I actually came very close to the extent that he could hear Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recite the Quran. That's how close he was. And he said, I saw Abu Bakr doing something again. He would go in front of him from far away. He's coming far from far away. He saw Abu Bakr coming in front of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi a little bit. Then coming behind Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, going to his right, going in. Basically, Abu Bakr doesn't know what to do. He's looking, trying to, to protect the prophets whichever way he can, making sure that nobody is following them or standing ahead of them or whatever it is. And Surah came that close to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he could hear his recitation of the Quran, but all of a sudden Allah SWT raises his head next to a hat and something extremely, again, miraculous happened. The horse of Saraqa ibn Malik starts sinking, the, the, like the feet or like the two like, uh, legs, like the front legs of the, of, the, of the horse, sank into the sand and Saraqa falls off. He said, look, he started pushing, pulling the, the, the horse, says, go, go, we need to catch him, we're about to get the... And then what happens is the horse comes out again, he rides on it, he goes back again, behind him again, to try to catch Rasulullah three times, and every single time this happens, and the, the, just the horse sinks into the into the sand. Rasulullah not even looking at it. And at that point, Suraqa he says, he said, "Now I understood that nobody can reach this guy, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Said, I know that this this is not a normal human being. This guy is protected." And at that point, he goes and he says, he asks for Aman. Aman is like me. He's like, again, I give up basically. I'm asking you for, again, for a treat. Let, let me just come close. I'm not going to do anything to you. And that's exactly what happened. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed him to come. And he says, Suraqa, he says, I knew when that happened that you are someone who's being protected. And this is beyond my capacity. And I'm here to offer you, what can I do to help? As a matter of fact, the narration says he offered them food and other stuff. He said, take whatever you want. You want to take my camel, my horse, take it. Anything you want to help you and support you on this journey. So a completely 180 degrees shift from him trying to attack them or trying to get them, uh, and, and, and now he's like, let me help you, how can I help you here, right? And then, Rasulullah said, no, I don't want anything from you. And then he says, okay, then write to me, like he write, write to me a, like a letter or some kind of, he said, a man, like a, a treaty, basically. I want to make sure that you basically give me this protection. So never, whenever anything happens in the future, he's not, he didn't become a Muslim yet. Whenever anything happens in the, in, in the future, that will be protecting, saying that I had a treaty with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so that, do not basically attack me or attack my people, right? And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually asked Amr ibn Fuhayra to write down this treaty for him. The last thing that happens during that time, as a matter of fact, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, out of all of this darkness, this is a very tough trip, he goes and he gets, tells Suraqa, says, Ya Suraqa, ma bika id albasaka Allahu suwaray kisra. Says, Ya Suraqa, he says, what do you think if one day comes, you'll be able to wear these, I don't know, like this, like, you know, the, the kings at that time, they would wear this kind of arm, like, I don't say bracelet, but like a lar large bracelet made of gold or whatever it is, shows like the, their, this is basically their, their level. And he says, Rasulullah Sallam gives the glad and says, one day you might be a person who would wear these of Kisra. Kisra is, uh, Surah Kisra is the, the Persian king or the Persian yeah, leader at that point. He says, one day, you might be one of these people who would be able to wear this, the armor, the, it's not the, the hand uh, armor or whatever it is of Kisra. And so I was like, what? You are a person passing through this hardship. You're trying to flee for your life to go to Medina. And you're telling me that one day you will, again, you'll have this Warai Kisra there. That's something. And also, as a matter of fact, they said they, either he wrote something for him or he just gave him the glad time. He said that one day that you are going to be able to do that. And yet another lesson, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supporting his Prophet وسلم, during that mission through miracles or others. But you can see also the hearts of the people shifting when this happens. And then now they are offering, Suraqa is offering his help to Rasulullah As a matter of fact, when he goes back, people start like we're trying to go to this, during this, this route to follow Rasulullah And Suraqa had an instrumental way of saying, you know, no, no, just move back. I just came back from there. There's nothing. He's not there, basically. Try to find somewhere else. And he was one of these people who pushed people away from trying to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, there are a lot of other lessons that can be learned from the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the, just the incident of Hijrah. Eventually, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know, makes it, alhamdulillah, to Medina, and then he, where he establishes 
Now it becomes Medina of the Rasul Sallallahu the, the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is where he starts establishing the Muslim community again in a different phase of their of the of of, of this uh, community. Right? And we know again the story goes afterwards. But I'll pause here. I'll stop here. And again, I don't know if the time permits, but I'll take maybe any questions that you might have or any comments, and we can go from there. Jazakallah. Jazakallah khair, Brother Adam. Um, so far, uh, I think uh, there are no questions, but um, I have one to post to you, inshallah, before we do end this uh, beautiful halakha. Uh, uh, Jazakallah khair again. Uh, it was beautiful. And um, what I want to ask is that, you know, um, one of the most important things I think you, you captured today was how families should be on the same page when it comes to uh, making this hijrah towards Allah, you know, for, for us nowadays, right? And and sometimes, um, you know, the, this hijrah to Allah should be on the mind of every single family member, right? And uh, so the question for you, uh, the issue we find ourselves in today uh, sometimes is that we're making hijrah away from our own family members, we find ourselves. Instead of um, making hijrah together towards Allah, some may feel like their whole life is trying to um, bring one of their family members, whether it be a mother uh, towards their daughter or, or a spouse uh, towards another. Um, it takes so much energy for people um, that they're hindered from actually making this, this hijrah to Allah. SubhanAllah, I, I remember myself when one of the shuyukh uh, from Namakka, he was saying, he came to visit uh, America and he was saying to the youth that, you know, your hijra is that, um, you know, you walk away from someone who was smoking. That's your minor hijra. Someone mm -hmm. making fun of the deen of Allah in a gathering, you walk away. That's your minor hijra. You know, someone is slandering someone who you're supposed to be defending. And if you can't, your minor hijra is that you go away from. So we find ourselves making these minor hijras, but... How is it, can you give us one advice uh, for family members to stay on the same page, right? Uh, when it comes to making this, uh, uh, um, this, the, this journey towards Allah? That's a tough question, right? Because it's one advice and it's going to be, again, I, I'm going to be bound. I'm, I'm just thinking. <laughs> we, we, I think we got like 10 minutes. I think we have one more question, but we, we do have, we have 10 minutes, inshallah. So, okay. So, no, another then, question was, where would you suggest to make hijrah these days? That's, that was another question we got. But, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go with, with one, two things. Okay, number one is, I, again, I, this is kind of a spare of a moment kind of response. And maybe if you think about it, I'll give you a better response next time. But your point is, how do we do hijrah towards our families or things along these lines? But that's a tough one, right? Because you, Rasulullah, even himself, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to call people towards the way of Allah SWT. We're trying to be on the same page. Whether, again, some of us, they're dealing with family members that might not be Muslim in the first place. Or some of us are dealing with family members that are Muslim, but might not be following the teachings of Islam as much. And that's why there is the huge diversity. A couple of things to keep in mind is one, again, and this is learning from the actual, uh, from the actual story of Al-Hijra itself. Number one is do your part, right? You need, you and I need to exert our utmost effort to call these people or to be on the same page. That's again, there's no one cookie cutter formula that will help us to do that. But everyone is different. But amongst these things that we can learn from the life of Prophet is, especially when we are talking to family members and we're asking family members again, to come to do the hijrah towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are harsh and tough, okay, people would just flee away from you. A lot of times we fall into this trap especially when it comes to our family members, that we're even harsher sometimes on them than we are with outside people. Why? Because we're in face-to-face, -face, we know them, we expect more from them, right? Never forget that one of the best ways, and this is, by the way, a reminder for myself first and foremost, I have my kids, my wife, and everyone as well, so I'm reminding myself here. We need to be as nice as possible. Allah subhanahu wa tells us as well, ila rabbika bil hikmati wal fil hasan. Ask or call for the words, the way, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with wisdom, okay? And the best of way and best of advices. That's even more pertinent for our family members, okay? So we need to call for them. Don't be hastily. Don't become, again, aggressive. Don't become tough or whatever it is. Nicely, with wisdom, okay? With your actions and things along these lines. That's one. This is your part and my part. The second point, which we learned from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this exact event is what? you need to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling his Prophet 
his love for his uncle was beyond anything that you can think about. He's protecting him and so forth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's not up to you. It's not you who guide people, whereas Allah is the one who's guiding people, who's changing hearts. So what we can do in that is relying on Allah. One of the best ways to rely on Allah in this fashion is complete, consistent and continuous dua. I'm doing my part by asking them, but I'm always raising my hand and saying, oh Allah, I don't know what the way, the best way to do it. I'm asking you to guide my family member or to get us all on the same page, right? Whereas the spectrum is just wide again. And I say, I'm not talking about the different uh, uh, situations that you can do that. But in all situations, going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with dua and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you, support you, change the heart and whatever it is, asking them for this, asking him subhanahu wa ta'ala for this, this works for every situation. That's something across the board. So I hope these two things, inshallah, would help. I hope this answers the question, first of all. Is it answering the question or not? Jazakallah khair. It does. Uh, one of the best things for, you know, um, for us to hear is that not everybody, not, you know, when you talk about the cookie cutter, right? Everybody's situations and circumstances are different, right? And subhanAllah, we have a deen that is flexible to the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, gives us uh, 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 the, the time uh, and to work with our family members. It's not just one fit, shoe fits it all, you know? So, yeah, so that's, right. that's a great answer, you know, every, and I'm sure that, hey, when you, if people were to ask you, you know, this is the issue I'm having with my, you know, I work with the youth, right? So this is the issue I'm having with my son, that's the issue I'm having with my wife. This the, it, It's a never endless thing, but Jazakallah khair for those two great devices, you know? And we should try our hardest. Uh, we should be nice about it, right? Uh, we should be merciful. And, and sometimes we forget that with our own family members. And secondly, don't ever um, uh, underestimate the continuous dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. 